In Joseph Campbell's book, The Masks of God, Volume 1, Primitive Mythology, Gamble includes biographies and quotes from several shamans living close to the North Pole. In this video, I'm going to read some of the stories and quotes Campbell includes about three shamans named Najakaneg, Ijukaruk, and lastly, Kinalik. We'll start with Najakaneg and his definition of the word Sila. Here's a quote from Campbell. And perhaps, the best summation, and perhaps the best summation of the ultimate import of these myths and rites for the courageous men and women whose very difficult lives they served is expressed in the sentiment resported, reported by Dr. Rasmussen of our little old friend Nanjakanek of North Alaska. Silam, or Silam Inuya, the inhabitant or soul Inua of the universe, is never seen. Its voice alone is heard. All we know is that it has a gentle voice, like a woman, a voice so fine and gentle that even children cannot become afraid. What it says is, Sila Ersinar Sinivduluj, do not be afraid of the universe. Sila Ersinar Sinivduluj, do not be afraid of the universe. When Dr. Rasmussen asked Najakanek if he believed of any of, of, of any of the powers that he spoke of, he answered, yes. There is a power that we call Sila, one that cannot be explained in so many words. One that cannot be explained in so many words. A strong spirit, the upholder of the universe, of the weather, in fact, all life on earth so mighty that his speech to man comes not through ordinary words, but through storms, snowfall, rain showers, the tempests of the sea, through all the forces that man fears, or through sunshine, calm seas, or small, innocent playing children who understand nothing. When times are good, Sila has nothing to say to mankind. He has disappeared into his infinite nothingness and remains away as long as people do not abuse life but have respect for their daily food. No one has ever seen Sila. His place of sojourn is so mysterious that he is with us and infinitely far away at the same time. His place of sojourn is so mysterious that he is with us and infinitely far away at the same time. Now, we will recount the story of a shaman named Ijakaruk, whose pithy maxim was, the only true wisdom lies far from mankind, out in the great loneliness, and it can be reached only through suffering. Privation and suffering alone can open the mind of a man to all that is hidden to others. The biography goes, in his youth, Strange unknown beings came to Ujakaruk and spoke to him, and when he awoke, he saw all the visions in his dream so distinctly that he could tell his fellows all about them. Soon it became evident to all that he was destined to become an Ankagok, uh, an a shaman, and an old man named Perquanok was appointed his instructor. In the depth of winter, when the cold was most severe, Yujukaruk was placed on a small sl sledge just large enough for him to sit on, and carried far away from his home to the other side of Hiku Hikoligjuag. Upon reaching the appointed spot, he remained seated on the sledge while his instructor built a tiny snow hut, with barely room for him to sit cross-legged. He was not allowed to set foot on the snow, but was lifted from the sledge and carried into the hut, where a piece of skin just large enough for him to sit on served as a carpet. No food or drink was given him. He was exhorted to think only of the great spirit and of helping and of the helping spirit should and of the helping spirit that should presently appear, and so he was left to himself and his meditations. After five days had elapsed, the instructor bought him a drink of lukewarm water, and with similar exhortations left him as before. He now fasted for fifteen days, when he was given another drink of water and a very small piece of meat, which was to last him a further ten days. At the end of this period, his instructor came for him and fetched him home. Ijukaruk declared that the strain of those thirty days of cold and fasting were so severe that he sometimes died a little, in quotes. During all the time, he thought of only the great spirit and endeavored to keep his mind free from all memory of human beings and everyday things. Toward the end of the thirty days, there came to him, toward the end of the thirty days, there came to him a helping spirit in the shape of a woman. 
She came while he was asleep and seemed to hover in the air above him. After that he dreamed of her no more, but she became his helping spirit. For five months following this period of trial, he was kept on the strictest diet and required to abstain from all intercourse with women. The fasting was then repeated, for such fasts at frequent intervals are the best means of attaining knowledge of hidden things. As a matter of fact, there is no limit to the period of study. It depends on how much one is willing to suffer and anxious to learn. A final quote from Ajukaruk is, Life is endless. Only we do not know what form we shall reappear after death. Women, too, became shamans. In the same community was Kinalik, a, a, still a young woman, as Dr. Rasmussen describes her, very intelligent, kind-hearted, clean, and good-looking, who spoke frankly and without reserve. Ijukaruk was her brother-in-law and had himself been her instructor in magic. Her initiation had been severe, she was hung up to some tent poles planted in the snow and left there for five days. It was midwinter, with intense cold and frequent blizzards, but she did not fear the cold, for the spirit protected her. When the five days were at an end, she was taken down and carried into the house, and Ijukaruk was invited to shoot her, in order that she might attain intimacy with the supernatural visions of death. The gun was to be loaded with real powder, but a stone was to be used instead of the leaden bullet, in order that she might retain connection with the earth. Ijukaruk, in, in the presence of the assembled villagers, filed the shot, and Kinalik fell to the ground unconscious. On the following morning, just as Ijukaruk was about to bring her to life again, she awakened from the swoon unaided. Ijukaruk asserted that he had shot her through the heart, and that the stone had afterward been removed and was in the possession of her old mother. Campbell goes on then to say that he believes that some of the claims made by these shamans are exaggerated. Um, so that's a tiny, a tiny little window into the life of an ancient human in the far, far north.